everybody, and welcome to Barnes Takeout. My name is Martha Lucy. I'm Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education at the Barnes. And today we are going to talk about this painting by Pierre-Auguste Renoir. It's called Bather and Maid, or the Toilette de la Benus, which means the Toilet of the Bather, and it was done around 1900. Uh, and before we get into it, I want to show you a picture of the painting on the wall at the Barnes. This is in room two, and you can see how big it is. Um, it's surrounded by works by um, Cezanne um, and Van Gogh. And this is much bigger. It's the size that you would see um, in, in, a, in the annual salon in Paris, uh, much more sort of academic size. So this painting comes relatively late in Renoir's career. He died in 1919 and he painted all the way up to the end, but this was done in 1900. So he still had a lot of work in front of him, but this is also a good 20 years after his Impressionist period when he was showing with Monet um, uh, in, during the 1870s and 80s. And while you can see that he still has kind of retained some of that Impressionist, the sort of loose brushwork, especially if you look in the background, see how it's kind of, it's kind of feathery brushwork back here. Um, but overall, the painting has a solidity to it and a kind of tightness and a, a sort of design to it that we that we don't typically associate with the Impressionists that is much more associated with academic painting or the sort of official um, painting of the time. The figures are incredibly sort of balanced and stable. The composition is stable. The, the main figure, this bather, is perfectly centered. Um, and the attendant is behind her, and together they form this kind of pyramid shape that takes up most of the composition. Um, there is a sort of a counteraction between the two that also, I think, reinforces the stability of the painting. The way that she leans a little bit this way, and then this figure leans a little bit the other way. You know, there's just this harmony um, between them that 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 creates this overall stability. Um, every the every every element of the painting has something that sort of rhymes with it that makes the the whole painting work together as a whole. Even things like this, you know, this this tree up here, this structure is kind of counterbalanced with this still life down here, which we're going to look at in a moment. Um, the use of color, the way that the red up here is then counterbalanced with the red down here. Um, the shapes, you know, there are all these rhyming shapes that um, are, are repeated throughout that kind of make the whole thing hold together. So I think this is a really dominant shape up here, this Y created by the tree. But then look how you see this Y shape repeated, or I guess I should say this V shape repeated in the neck line, um, in the arms of the bather, you know, down here. It's just, um, it really makes the whole thing hold together. The way that this figure is framed by the hair coming out on both sides. Um, and also just look at the way that they, um, that the figures, that, that Renoir emphasizes tactility in this painting, the sort of physicality of, um, of the body in space. Um, the body in space here is not some visual phenomenon, which it would have been in an impressionist exhibition. It would have been sort of like a, a, a something that you that you glimpse that kind of light shimmers off of the way that it would, um, you know, a boat or or water. But here he's really emphasizing the the kind of material materiality of the body and making it into a solid form with his use his kind of sculptural use of light, and emphasizing the sense of touch, um, even by the way that the, the figures themselves are engaged in the act of touch. All four hands are holding something. And look at the way that these hands, when you look at them together, they kind of form this pyramid. So all of this is to say that it's a very tightly designed um, composition. And critics at the time um, noted this, celebrated the painting for this um, quality. So even the, the subject here is has a kind of academic feel to it. 
Um, it looks like it could be, you know, Venus bathing um, uh, in the woods. Uh, we know that it's not a, a, a Venus. It's it's actually supposed to be. It's meant to be a modern French woman. He gives us little clues about this in the still life down here in the foreground. You see a hat. I'm gonna zoom in on this, and you can also see this corset here, which was, um, you know, a, a sign, very much a con sign of contemporary fashion at the time. Um, but what's interesting is that when you think about this compared to other toilette scenes or scenes of women bathing and getting ready and, you know, powdering and dressing, um, and these were a very popular subject at the time that Renoir was painting, all of the the avant-garde, the, everybody was doing toilette scenes. But usually they take place indoors. I'm thinking of Toulouse-Lautrec, I'm thinking of Seurat, thinking of Degas. Um, they usually take place indoors and um, there's much more of an emphasis on artifice and sort of the making up of the body and the transformation of the body into something that's kind of artificial. And Renoir, I feel like he is sort of saying, yes, this is a toilette scene, but but we are going to emphasize the 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 the, the naturalness of and celebrate the naturalness of the female body. He did not like corsets. He thought that they were corrupt. He much preferred um, the natural body over the artificial one. And so I read this with the corset kind of cast off to the side as Renoir um, kind of ranking nature above artifice. I think that it's a celebration of the female body in nature. And of course, um, it's an I idealized female body very much in the in that academic tradition. Um, now, Barnes bought this in 1935. And when he bought this, the painting was um, was very was 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 sort of having a moment um, in the press because it had been traveling around and going to a lot of different exhibitions, and it was singled out by critics as being, you know, one of Renoir's best works. And Barnes got it when it was shown at the Binu Gallery in 1935, and um, you know, it to 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 great fanfare. The um, press reported on it. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that earlier that year, Barnes had published his book called The Art of Renoir. So before he bought this painting, and he talks about this painting in the book and, and calls it banal and academic. You know, he celebrates certain aspects of it. He said, he says, you know, it's this great design, but, you know, it's it it feels like a very much like a like an like an academic painting. Um, so it's interesting that he then buys it a couple of months later, and then in later editions of the Art of Renoir, he never he never retracts what he what he says about it. So it could be that he was um, it could be that he was that maybe he changed his mind. Maybe he once he saw it again in New York, he decided that you know what this really is a great painting and I need it for my collection. Um, and it but it also could be that he did really feel that the painting had some faults and that he he wanted to include it um, because he and he said at different points that he wanted to be able in his collection to show the the, the best work of an artist but also an artist's um, failings and so because this was a teaching collection maybe he felt that it was sort of beneficial to have something that he felt um, you know, wasn't wasn't perfect. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed today's takeout and um, please tune in again next week. Thanks. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.